So let's get right down to business because today I'm concluding the series I began several weeks ago on the family called Caring for Your Clan. And I've been kind of expanding, extending the idea of the family to include more than our immediate family, but our extended family, our family friends, our church friends, our work friends, our neighbor friends, and that is your clan. And you know, it was George Burns, the late George Burns, the comedian, who said this. He said, happiness is a large, loving, caring, close-knit family in another city, <laughs> is what he used to say. Uh, but the scripture teaches something much different. And so week one, I asked this question. I said, who is your clan? And I talked about how Mother Teresa said the problem with the world was that we draw the circle of our family too small. And then we look at Jesus and we looked at this and it says he looked in a circle and said, this is my family. And what Jesus did was he extended and expanded his family. And here's what was fascinating to me about Jesus. We know Jesus was single. He had no wife. He had no children. And yet for him, family was was everything. You know, uh, a number of years ago, we had this singles conference here at the church in this room, and we had a speaker by the name of Dennis Frank. And as he was speaking to this group of hundreds of singles from all across the city, every time he referred to Jesus, he said, and Jesus, who was single, and then he went on like this. And at the very, very end of the conference, he ended it like this, he prayed. And then in the conclusion of his prayer, he said, in the name of Jesus, who was single, amen. <laughs> I know, he's just driving home that point that God loves singles, which of course he does. So that was week one. Week two, we talked about from cradle to grave and the fact that only the family has the capacity to care for the family from cradle to grave. And I asked how many of you were your brother's keeper, and most of you responded to that. Then when I asked you how many of you were your parents' keeper, I got a little less response because that's the hard one in an aging population. Uh, I have this story I just love. It's about these two boys. They grew up on the farm in Saskatchewan, and one, the younger one, he stayed and, and helped his father and took over the farm. The other one went off to college and got a degree and then ended up in New York in the financial district. And he was involved with mergers and acquisition, acquisitions and big business and all that. And so then anyway, one day, the father passed away. So the younger brother phoned the older brother in New York and said, dad's passed away, the funeral's on Wednesday, are you gonna be able to come? He said, no, no, I got a big merger happening on Wednesday, so I won't be able to come, but I'll tell you what, bury dad in a nice suit and send me the bill. So a month later, the guy in New York, he gets a bill for $500. A month later, another bill for $500. A month later, another bill for $500. He phones up his brother and goes, what's going on here? He said, you said bury dad in a nice suit, so I rented him a tux. <laughs> hey, that's good, isn't it? And so last week, my message was entitled Straight Out of Capernaum. And I talked about how Jesus went into the city of Capernaum. He gathered this group of young men who were all in their 20s, and he created a clan with these guys. And he brought them literally straight out of Capernaum and into the world where they changed all of history and, of course, changed their world. And it was a bit of a play on words with the movie Straight Out of Compton which was all about this group of rappers rising out of Compton, California in the 80s and the 90s and how they were influenced and they were really a product of their peers and their community and the brokenness of that community. And so the whole message was geared to this. How do we as parents, how do we counteract the influence of the world? How do we counteract the influence of our kids' peers, their social media, their culture? And these pressures are greater on young people than they have ever been before. And then I said, here's how you're gonna do it. You gotta know how to rap the next generation, using the whole rap theme. And I'm gonna throw it up on the screen, just remind you what it was. It was an acrostic, R-A-P, and the three ways that we counteract the influence of peers is number one, the R is to remember, to remain a re-influencer. The A was to always award affirmation, and the P was to prepare to pray perpetually. So last week we began into this and I talked about how important it was for you not only to influence your children, but to remain an influencer or a re-influencer. And as these different influences, as our kids get older, they come under greater and greater external inf influences. And if we don't counteract them, if we don't remain involved, and here's the one thing I think I've observed in 40 years of pastoring a church, 
When I look at families, when I get to know families, I actually have a pretty good idea, and I've been around long enough to see it actually happen. I have a pretty good idea which families and which kids are gonna turn out okay. And you know what they are, more often than not? And it's not perfect, there are exceptions to this rule, but more often than not, the parents that are involved with the children's lives, the ones that are pressing in and getting involved and staying involved and staying engaged with their kids, those kids grow up to be these well-established and well-balanced young people that know how to serve God. Why? Because the parents were connected. And you know this is true. You look around us, you see parents that are so clued out they don't know what their kids are doing. They don't know who their friends are. They don't know what they're watching on TV or on the internet. They don't know where they are at night. And those kids are the ones that are gonna end up in trouble. So what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna look at a little verse here as my text. That'll be our jump off spot. It's a very famous passage. It's one of the last things that's said in the entire Old Testament. And it is such a powerful statement on family. And here it is, Malachi chapter four, verse five, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and the dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Interesting to me that the book of Genesis begins with the establishment of the family, which is the bedrock of our world, the bedrock of every civilization was a family. And then the last thing he says in the Old Testament, in the book of Malachi, is he reminds us that before the end comes, he's going to do one thing and one thing alone. He's going to turn the hearts of the fathers, the hearts of the parents towards the children and the hearts of the children back to the parents. And he says, if I don't do this, I will strike the earth with a curse. I'd like to take that a little further. I don't think he needs to strike anything. I think we know one thing when the family breaks down. When the family becomes fragmented, the earth becomes cursed. Our world becomes a cursed and broken place because the family is the foundation. And I love the fact that he says that this is his heart. And of all, all the things he could have said, all the things he could have said, at the end of the Old Testament, he reminds us that it's all about family. So I'm going to tell you one of my favorite stories about this. It's the story of Bill Havens. Bill Havens, back in the 20s, he was a canoeist. He was a competitive canoeist. And he actually made the US Olympic team to go to the Paris Olympics in 1924. And it was a pretty exciting thing for him to make the team. He was pretty much the world champion at that time. He had a good chance of winning a gold medal. But as it were, his wife was pregnant and she was due with their first child on the very same day as his race. And she said, you know, you go, you go to Paris, I'll be fine. Don't worry about me, I can get through this on my own. And he thought about it, he thought, I can't do that. I am not missing the birth of my first child so I can go and pursue my sports career. And he decided not to go to the Olympics and he decided he was gonna be there for the birth of his child. Now in the inimitable fashion of children, his son was three weeks late. <laughs> and as it was, he could have gone to Paris, competed and been back in time for his child to be born. But how does he know such a thing? But here's where the story gets really fascinating. 28 years later, their son that was born was named Frank. And 28 years later, they get a call from Helsinki, Finland collect call because that's what kids do and he phones collect and he says I have some news for you and he says I have just won the gold medal in the Helsinki Olympics in canoeing his son 28 years later went and repeated the very goal that his father had and gave up and sacrificed here's a picture of of uh, Frank Havens in, in number 190 in that competitive race where he wins the gold medal and he came home, and this is maybe the coolest part of this whole story. He came home and he presented the medal to his father because he knew his father had given up his own dream for his son to be there with him. And see, that's a little bit of a picture of what happens when we are integrally involved with the lives of our children, that there's always gonna be a sacrifice. There's always gonna be a price to pay but that price is always worth it. And we need to remain an influencer. So the second point in this message, and this is where I'm gonna pretty much camp uh, in the continuation of Straight Out of Capernaum is this. We need to always award 
affirmation. And that what we need more than anything else as we're growing up, and I'll spend a lot of time on this today, is we need the affirmation of our parents. So I've reminded you throughout this series about the family moments in Jesus' life. The ones that are recorded in the Gospels are his birth, his 12-year-old visit to the temple, his 30-year-old beginning of his ministry, and then, of course, when he was on the cross dying. And we have no reference whatsoever as what happened between the time he was 12 years old and the time he was 30. I mean, there's not one reference, not one story. We don't know what happened in that period of time. And here's what I would say, though, because by the time he was 30, I would conclude that Mary and Joseph were pretty good parents. Do you know why I think that? Their son became a messiah. I would consider that a success, wouldn't you? If your son becomes a messiah, you probably did a pretty good job of raising your kids. But more importantly than that, I think there's more to this story, is his relationship with his heavenly father. And so we pick up the story. He's gone to Bethany beyond the Jordan. We know his cousin John the Baptist is preaching out there. He's water baptizing people in the Jordan. And Jesus shows up at 30 years old. And so he gets baptized like we did this morning. We baptized some people. Uh, Jesus himself got baptized. And when he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And then the voice from heaven came. And the voice said, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. You know what that is? Affirmation. He awarded his son affirmation, the words from heaven. This is my son, and I'm well pleased. Now, here's what I find interesting. So he was pleased with his son. What so far had Jesus actually done? Nothing that we know of. I mean, maybe, you know, he's a carpenter, so maybe he built a few bird hoses. Who knows? Uh, but we don't see him actually having done anything. He hadn't preached any sermon, hadn't raised any dead, hadn't healed any sick, hadn't clean, cleansed any lepers. And yet, the Lord says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So what was he pleased about? Here's the point, and I don't want you to miss it. He wasn't pleased about what he had done. He was pleased with who he was. You see, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well placed. And so the affirmation was all about who he was, not what he did. Now, this is an important distinction for us because those of you that have raised kids and are raising kids, you know what it's like. You praise your kids for, whether you like it or not, for what they do. And when they do something good, you praise them. When they don't do something good, you, you're not as excited about it. And that's called performance orientation, when you give praise or affirmation for things that are well done. And it's, it's inevitable. We, we have a hard time getting away from it. But we have to be careful with it. So I was at a hockey game. Some friends invited me to watch their kid play hockey. And there was this other kid uh, out in the ice, and he scored two goals, and a uh, good little player. And he, when he came off the ice, he was so excited about scoring two goals, and he came up to his dad, typical hockey dad, when you hear this story. And he said, Daddy, Daddy, did you see I scored two goals today? To which his father said, and if you hadn't missed that third shot, you would have had a hat trick. And I thought, really, Captain Demotivation? You're really going to poke a pin in this poor kid and then after that? And I thought, you know, we can't go through life like that, that, that we can never actually achieve the expectations of our father. And we need to be willing and able to affirm our kids for who they are, not what they've done. So one of the things that happened to us, because we've always been pretty good at this, Kathy and I were both uh, raised in families where we received a lot of affirmation growing up. And so we sort of raised our kids the same way. I wouldn't say we were perfect parents by any stretch of the imagination, but we were good at affirming our kids and praising our kids. And so when the church was young, we had this a bunch of young couples, a bunch of 30-somethings with a bunch of kids running around the church. And there was this one couple, same age as us, kids the same age as ours, and they pulled us aside one day and they said, we want to talk to you about something. And we said, sure. They said, we're not comfortable with how you were raising your children. <laughs> I said, really? I said, what, what's the problem? They said, well, we think you lavish too much praise on your children. And we're worried that they're going to grow up to be conceited and arrogant. I thought for just a moment, because I generally don't think very long. And I thought for a moment and I said, you know what? I think I would rather take the risk of having to reel in a little overconfidence of my older kids than have to sentence them to a lifetime of low self-esteem. And I think that's just a risk 
I'm willing to take. And you see, here's a little side note on that. You know these people that are arrogant and boastful and proud, always bragging about themselves? I got news for you. They were not overpraised as children. They're actually overcompensating for something that's missing in their lives. Do you think they're really confident? You don't have to go around telling people how great you are if you actually feel good about yourself. You are compensating for a deficiency in your life. Those people, those arrogant people, are not actually self-confident people. So what we've done is, is we brought our kids up in this environment, and, and, and it's, you gotta be careful with it. And, and here's another little sidebar for you. As a parent for me, I don't know if you've noticed this about my personality, I'm a bit sarcastic. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. Just on occasion, rare occasions. So I had to teach my kids sarcasm because kids don't get sarcasm. And I, you know, I'm a sarcastic guy, so I taught them really early to get it. So we were at a volleyball game. You remember a few weeks ago, my daughter preached and she talked about her volleyball career and she really was a, an exceptional volleyball player. And I went to one of her high school games and uh, she got up to serve and she served 15 aces in a row. I've never seen that in any volleyball game at any level. It was embarrassing to me to see these, these poor kids that could not return a serve. And so at the end of the game, she pulled this on me. She came running up to me and she said, Pop, did you see I served 15 aces in a row? To which I said, I thought you could have done better. I bet you could have done 20. <laughs> and this mother glared at me like this and said, are you serious? 15, you think she could have done better than that? I said, I'm kidding. And my daughter knows that I'm kidding. And I thought, you know, she doesn't really need praise for scoring 15 aces. I think she probably knew she did all right. What do you think? I think she knew she did all right. I felt embarrassed for the other parents. So I was being humble, right? You get what I'm going with this? <laughs> Some of you are not buying it. But here's the thing. As a parent, it's really hard. Because, you know, when you're, it's hard not, how do you praise your kids when they're not doing well? It's hard to praise them for who they are because we're so confronted by what they're doing, right? So your son brings home a test. He's got an F on his math test. What do you say? How are you going to praise him? Well, you go, hey, Dylan, really proud of the way you got up out of bed this morning. Way to go on that. Way to get to school three times this week. Proud of you for that. And I know you're busy gaming all night and it's a struggle to study, but you know, we would love it. Hey, if you studied maybe a little bit, maybe for half an hour, maybe you would have got a D. You know, how do you talk to dopey Dylan, right? How do you encourage this kid that you want to strangle? Right? It, it gets a little harder. And then I want you to hearken back to when your kids were little, when they were toddlers. Everything they did, you praised them for. When they took their first step, you remember how you went crazy? Oh my goodness. You'd think that first step was on the moon. One small step for Dylan, right? And you know, you got so excited about it. And when you're potty training them, it's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. I mean, the kid poops in a pot and you go nut. That's a good boy. You're pointing at the poop. That's a good boy. I'm thinking, he pooped in a pot. He didn't, he didn't cure cancer, for goodness sakes. I know for a fact you're not going to do that and say that when he's a teenager. Seriously, Dylan, you pooped in a pot? What were you, what were you thinking of? <laughs> Did I create a mental image you didn't really need about Dylan? <laughs> you have teenagers, you know what I'm talking about. So, so here's, here's what I'm trying to get at, is that this need for affirmation is so important for, for this next generation. If we don't give them the affirmation, if they don't get it from us, who are they going to get it from? They're not going to get it from the, their uh, peers. They're not going to get it from the world. And it's incumbent upon us. And let me add one little small piece to this. You know, we, we see Jesus getting affirmed for who he was. And if you look into the Old Testament, you see something really interesting that the fathers actually affirmed or blessed or praised their children, not only for what they were, but what they were going to become. And it's called the blessing of the father. You, see, you, saw, you saw Noah do it with his kids. You saw Abraham do it. You saw Isaac do it. You see Jacob doing it as one of the most famous examples. You can go read it, Genesis chapter 49. He lines up his 12 sons, and he goes through them one by one, and he declares the blessing over them. 
and they're very specific, very clear. In fact, go read it because it's interesting. It's not only about who they were and who they were going to become, but he says this is what will happen in the last days. He says this is not just for you, but this is for your lineage. And what is fascinating when you look at the 12 sons of, of, of Jacob, who of course became the 12 tribes of Israel, not only did they become who their father said they were going to become, but so did their sons and their sons' sons and the tribes and clans that went on for generations. And now thousands of years later, I want you to think about this, the most persecuted people in the whole planet have been the Jewish people. There have been nation after nation that tried to eradicate them, yet they are still here. And not only are they here, they are the single most successful ethnic group in history, the Jews. Give you an example, in North America, 2% of the population is Jewish, and yet 25% of the richest people in North America are Jewish. 33% of Supreme Court justices are Jewish. 33% of the Nobel Prize winners are Jewish. 66% of the Tony Award winners are Jewish. And I'm making this one up. 99% of them are comedians, <laughs> right? How is that possible? I'll tell you how it's possible. What happens is when parents sow those blessings and affirmation into the next generation, there is no limits to who they can become and what they can accomplish. Now, I want to contrast that with what happens when we allow our children, instead of having that peer, or sorry, that family influence, they have the peer influence. When we let go of our kids and we let them go and find their own way in this world. And there's several things that can't happen. Now, I, I, I'm going to throw it up on the screen. I'm going to spend a few minutes on this. This is the pros and cons of peer orientation. Letting our kids be raised by their peers is what I mean by that. And the cons are acceptance. They're not going to get any. Individuality, they're not going to get that because they teach conformity. Maturity, how can immature people produce mature people? And the, there is a list of pros. The one thing is they'll have friends, which is a good thing, not belittling that. But when you look at these other things, you, when you let your kids be raised and influenced uh, inordinately by their peers, there's no way that it can possibly ever mature, uh, uh, produce acceptance. And when you look at young people, would you agree with me that they have a profound, almost pathological need for acceptance? It's sort of true, true right? When you remember, how, how many of you went to high school? How many of you went to high school? Really, like a quarter of the room went to high school? <laughs> I'm just so pleased I have an educated crowd with me today. And I bet out of that quarter, a bunch of you probably graduated too, right? <laughs> so, no, I know you all went to high school. How many of you remember what social dynamics were like in high school? Do you remember how fickle and ephemeral the friendships and the relationships were? You remember how people got dropped from groups and friendships like that? They just got dropped like a hot potato. And maybe it didn't happen to you, but maybe you were the one doing the dropping. Or if you didn't or were part of that, you know somebody that was. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Every single person in this room knows about that. There is something very insecure about high school. And it's just the nature of the beast. Whereas at, at home, at family, you have security. You get into high school, man, there's no security. So let me ask you a question, going out on a limb here. How, how many of you have ever seen the movie Mean Girls? Mean Girls with Lindsay Lohan. There's a, you, you, this movie. So, so when this movie came out, you're not going to believe this, I went out and rented it. And normally I don't watch movies about teenage girls, but it was written by Tina Fey, 30 Rock. And I thought, maybe it's, I heard good reviews, I'm going to rent it. So, so Kathy and I watched Mean Girls. And it's the story of Lindsay Lohan's character. She was homeschooled, comes into this high school. There's this in-group of girls called the Plastics. You, you got to love it. The Plastics. She tries to get into the in-group and get shunned and by this in-group. And so then she actually ends up with the, the geeks. And they end up you know, kind of competing. It's kind of a revenge movie thing. But I'm telling you, for me as a man, it was an absolute eye-opener. And at the end of the movie, I turned to Kathy and I said, is that what teenage girls are really like? To which she said, sadly, yes. Two months later, it's on television. It's a, a little more sanitized version. So I called my girls down and I said, girls, my, they were 14 and 16 years old, my two daughters. And I said, we're watching Mean Girls together. 
with your dad. <laughs> they went, what? I said, no, nope, that's what we're doing tonight. Put your homework away. We're watching Mean Girls. And they had, I made them sit down with their father and watch Mean Girls. And I said, at the end of the movie, we're going to have a discussion about it. <laughs> and so we watched through that movie, all this female bullying and shunning and, and the things they were doing to one another. And then we sat down and we discussed it. And I said, this is what's going on in your little worlds right now. And, and you need to guard yourself against this. And how, how many of girls, ladies in the room know what I'm talking about here? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, you know, Tina Fey wrote this. It, she actually was writing about her own experience in high school. Interesting part of that story. So recently I was, I was watching an interview with this guy by the name of Jonathan Haidt. And he, he's written this book uh, called The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. And the book is primarily about the influences of social media on young people. And uh, just for you f reference, he's a professor of uh, social psychology at the University of uh, New York. Uh, here's a picture of him. And uh, he, he talks about uh, bullying, first of all. And uh, when it comes to guys, uh, and you'll remember this, the way guys bully is they do it physically. And if you're afraid of being bullied and you're afraid some guys are going to hold you down, punch you in the face, and that's sort of, you know, we're a bunch of cavemen. So that's how you bully. That is not how girls bully. Go, girls bully by shunning, shaming, and ruining the reputation of others. And it can be absolutely brutal, which I learned from the movie Mean Girls. But what he said is what's happened with social media is it's taken it to a whole different level. And we all know what it's called. It's called cyberbullying. It is far more prevalent than you could possibly imagine. And here's something I had never thought about. You're not going to like it when I tell you this. But he says, with the advent of cell phones, he says, the boys use their cell phone for gaming and viewing porn. He said, the girls use their cell phone for social media. And he says, they have psychologists that have actually produced these algorithms for how uh, social media works. And, and many of you know this, it's been in the news a lot lately about how they lead them down this path and, and what they think is their interest because it's all about generating revenues. And they use the same psychologists that study gambling behavior and the same thing that allows gamblers to, or them to trick gamblers into becoming addictive is the same thing they do with social media. And one of the most addictive forces in the world today is actually social media. And the point that he makes is that the girls in particular have been inordinately affected by the negative effects of social media, which of course social media is not all bad in itself, and I know that. But I want to throw you up a graph. This is what he talked about, about depression rates. These are people that have had a, a major depressive episode or social anxiety in the last year. And so it's going along fairly flat, and all of a sudden, 2011, it takes off, and it's doubled, amongst girls in particular, it's doubled the episodes of social anxiety and depression. And he points out that the correlation is this. In 2006, uh, Facebook went global. Most young people did not have cell phones or smartphones yet because they were too expensive. But he says by 2010, 2011, there was pretty much a cell phone in every teenager's hand. And since that point, the cyberbullying has gone through the roof, and the psychological effects on young people has been profound. And then uh, he pointed out this one, this next graph uh, is about suicide and how the suicide rates also have doubled and tripled in the same period of time. So something is really broken, something's really off. And then this weekend, or this week, I was reading an article, and it, this is what it was called. It said, tech moguls who invented social media have banned their children from it. Silicon Valley parents are pulling the plug. And it went through a number of these developers of social media and, and computer platforms. Uh, Steve Jobs, for example, when uh, he came out with the iPad, he would not let his children have an iPad. Bill Gates didn't let his kids have cell phones till they were 14 years old. And it just went through one after another how they actually know the detrimental effects of social media. And so they actually ban the very people that are producing this stuff are banning their kids from it. If that doesn't tell you something, it really should. So the first thing that our peers can't produce is acceptance. In fact, they will produce exactly the opposite. Only family can really truly accept young people. The second one is about individuality. 
And uh, you know, the thing is, is, is this about, about culture, is that our cultures, wherever we're growing up, and in any age, not just this age, but when you're peer oriented, you don't actually have any individuality. They sort of impress upon you to think the same, act the same, look the same, dress the same, do everything the same. When you look at young people, do you see them dressing differently from one another? Do you see them acting differently from one another? No, you, you don't. It's all about conformity. It's not about individuality. It doesn't produce individuality. And you want to fit in. And the way you fit in is you act like, dress like, think like, do things like everybody else, and then maybe you'll fit in, right? And, and today, I'm going to go where angels fear to tread. Today, you know what the big deal is? It's tattoos and, and piercing. And, uh, you know, I don't want to insult anybody. I'm not going to. But if you're under 40 years old, there's a good chance you have one because it's become the cultural icon. It's become the tribal symbol of the, the generation is to get a tattoo. And so if you have a tattoo, I don't care. That's your business. None of my business. But I do find it amusing. When young people come to me, they, you know, a lot of times these young people come up to me and they want, I don't know why they want to show their pastor their new tattoo, but they do. And they say, Pastor Mark, what do you think of my new tattoo? I said, oh, is it a squid? No, it's an eagle. <laughs> I say, well, you, you need a better artist, man. That looks like a squid to me. And so then I always ask the same question and they always give me the same answer. And my question is this, I'm just curious, just help me understand your culture. So why did you get this tattoo? And they always say, well, I'm expressing my individuality. Or in the case of a pierced tongue, I'm expressing my individuality. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? If everybody's doing it, it's not individuality. It's conformity, right? Why do we think that that's individuality? If everybody else is doing it and I'm doing it so I'll fit in with them, that's not individuality. That's conforming with a culture. And I understand this. Those of you that are closer to my age, remember, we had our own pressures. Those of you that grew up, how many of you grew up in the 60s? Anybody grew up in the 60s with me? And you'll remember the thing then was, was long hair. And what happened was the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, they were growing their hair long. And uh, you know, <laughs> in the 60s, let me tell you, our dads cut our hair. And there was only one of two ways they did it. Either they put a bowl on your head and cut it around like a rim, or they, they took out the razor and just shaved it right down to the wood. And, uh, and so those are the two haircuts kids have. And so now all of a sudden we got you know, Mick Jagger and we got John Lennon, they got this long hair and, and oh, I desperately wanted long hair. And uh, my, my dad wouldn't let me have it, you know? And, uh, and in fact, here was the deal, you remember if you were growing up in the 60s, if it went over your ears, that was the sacred line. And uh, if it went over your ears, man, you're going straight to hell. And your dad came out with a razor and down to the wood it went again. So what I did was I would always go like this uh, at home. My hair was always tucked in behind my ears as close as it could. I'd wet it, put it behind my ears. And then I'd go off to school and I'd take that hair and I'd put it over my ears like this. And then I was a real goofball. I had big uh, bell-bottom pants and platform shoes and I'd be walking down the street. I could barely walk in those, they were so high. And I'm walking down the street, my platform shoes, my hair over my ears. Man, did I think I was cool. And if I would forget, to roll the hair back behind my ears. When I got home, there was another haircut coming. So my brother, he turns 18 and he goes off to Europe and he comes down, back with his hair down to here. Now he's an adult, he can do what he likes. My dad did not like it. And my dad, my brother's Brad was, name was Brad and my dad tried to shame him by calling him Brenda. <laughs> he called him Brenda for three years. My brother didn't care. And so I would have these ongoing arguments with my dad. Why can't I have long hair? Because it's wrong, that's why. Mike down the street has long hair, to which my dad would say, and if Mike jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? I said, of course I'd jump off a bridge if Mike jumped. What could, what's that got to do with anything? We're not talking about bridges. When it comes to bridges, if Mike jumps off the bridge, I'm jumping off the bridge. I didn't want to tell my dad we had already jumped off the bridge. <laughs> we, we went down to the Elm Park Bridge by the B, BDI ice cream. We jumped off that bridge. I'd already done that. I'm thinking for a smart man, my dad's not a very good arguer. What has a bridge got to do with my hair? Anyway, I didn't win the argument. All through school, got the haircuts, got the haircuts. Finally, I turned 18, went off to university. Guess what I did? I grew up my hair. 
I grew it down to my shoulders. Here's a picture of when I was in university. Oh, by the way, I not only grew my hair, but I became a cowboy. <laughs> I have no idea why. I spent like four years in a cowboy face. And that's not a costume. I'm not at a costume party. Look at the guy behind me. He has a tie on. I dressed like a cowboy for four years, and I have no idea why. And, and that shirt, I still have that shirt. You've seen it on pie auctions. 40-year-old shirt. And it still fits. How about them apples, huh? Huh? <laughs> thank, thank, thank you for humoring me on that. So anyway, it's graduation time. We got to get our pictures. And I'm thinking, do I really want to look like this, a cowboy with long hair in my grad pictures? I decided I didn't. I went out and got the preppiest haircut you ever seen in your life and put on a suit and tie. And this is how I showed up for my graduation. And I just made myself look like that. And that was because I thought, if I end up as prime minister someday, which is very likely, I mean, it seemed like it at the time. Do I really want myself looking like Walker, Texas Ranger in these photos? I want this one showing up. And the amazing thing about that picture, you're probably all thinking that, 40 years later, and I look exactly the same. <laughs> I haven't changed in 40 years. How, how many of you think this is uncanny? N no, nobody. You, you, know, I, you know, I had this teenager come up to me after the first service, and he says, Pastor Mark, you do look just like you did 40 years ago. Funny how you look 75 40 years ago. <laughs> that's, that's, what, that's what he said to me. Yeah, I smacked him. <laughs> Here, here's what I want to say about, about individuality. You see, God has created us all unique, has he not? Every single one of us has a unique genetic makeup. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. We were created in the image of God. Every single human being is distinct from the other. Why would we want our kids to be conforming to this world? Because the scripture says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. And what we want for our kids is our kids to be themselves, who God has created them, and to become everything that God has destined them to be, not to be just like like the world, right? I'm getting the end here, I really am. La last thing that the peers can't produce is maturity. <laughs> How come your dopey kids' friends possibly mat you know, mature your kids? The only people that can mature young people are adults. And it's okay for them to have friends, but don't expect them to bring them to maturity, right? And so here's what happened to me. When I was a, a kid, a teenager, my parents never had the sex talk with me. I guess it was too uncomfortable, just didn't happen. So thankfully, I had a friend named Blair who was a 13-year-old expert on sex. He knew everything about it. It was amazing how experienced and knowledgeable he was. He knew everything about sex. And he sat me down one day and he explained the whole thing to me all the parts, the anatomy, the function. My eyes were like saucers as he explained it in great detail. There was only one little teeny insy problem with that. He had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> but nobody ever corrected me. So I didn't really understand. So imagine my surprise on my wedding night. You know what? It's a miracle we had kids, really, considering how little I knew. And then I got this curveball. We had kids, as you know. And when one of my daughters was seven years old, she came up to me and said, Pop, I have a question. I said, oh, yeah, what is it? She said, uh, where do babies come from? And I panicked. I thought, I don't know. I only know what Blair taught me. And that's not much. <laughs> and, I, and I was humming, and I was hawing. And, and finally, I said, you know, why don't you ask your mom? And she looked right at me and said, you don't know either, do you? <laughs> Here's my point in all this, is that we have to remain influencers in our children's lives, and we need to always award affirmation, because none of these things can come from their peers. They can only come from you. So the final and last thing is this, and I'll just crash land the message with this, is that we always need to prepare to pray perpetually. Because you know what? You can actually be a pretty good parent. You can do most of the things right. You can take courses and read books, and you can do everything you can do and do as well as you can do, and you can still have your kids run into trouble. And you know what? You can beat yourself up on that, but here's the ace in the hole, is that we always have prayer. We can always take it to God in prayer. So I just want to close with one final story. It's the story of, of Franklin Graham. 
We all know Franklin Graham, he took over Billy Graham Evangelist Association. He's also the president of Samaritan's Purse. It might actually be bigger than the Billy Graham Association. And yet, when we look at his life growing up, he grew up in the household of Billy and Ruth Bell Graham. I mean, his parents were probably pretty good parents. And yet he became a rebel. And when he was a young person, he was out smoking and drinking and running around. And he writes a book about it. It's called Rebel with a Cause. And in the book, he tells the story of his mom. Because what he would do on Sunday morning is he would get up and jump on his motorbike and take off and skip church. And so his mom started to pray. And this is how she prayed. I'm not recommending it, but this is what she did. She prayed and said, Lord, I need you to get a hold of Franklin. And I want you to hurt him. Just don't kill him. <laughs> I bet you haven't prayed that one for your kids. Hurt him, Lord, just don't kill him. So anyway, one Sunday morning, took off on his motorbike, hit a root, broke his ankle. And she said, thank you, Jesus. You hurt him and didn't kill him. And you know, the end of the story is this. The next Sunday, he ended up going to church on crutches because he's got a broken leg. He's not going out anywhere. And the next week after that, on crutches. The next week after that, on crutches in church. And during that time, God had got a hold of him and he turned his life back to Christ. And of course, as they say, the rest of the story is history. You see, the power of prayer has the ability to change and transform anyone. Folks, we have the toughest and most difficult job of anything on this planet. And that's bringing the next generation up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. But let me remind you that family matters and you can make a difference. And if you will press in with your kids, if you can build that clan and hold them and pull them together, I'm telling you, nothing shall be impossible for you. Let's stand together. All right, I want to ask you all to close your eyes and bow your heads just for a moment if you would. And I know there's people in this room that probably have not joined the family of God yet, and I want to give you an opportunity to do that. And I'm not going to single you out. I'm not going to call you forward. I'm not going to ask you to say anything publicly. But if you have not said yes to Jesus, I'm not asking you, have you been to church? I know you're at church. But I'm asking you this. Have you invited Christ into your life to be your personal Lord and Savior? And if you haven't done that, I want to give you that opportunity. And you will, by virtue of that decision, become a member of the family of God. And if you're online, I want you to just click that little hand that comes up in the screen. And if you're in the room, I want you to raise your hand just for a moment so I can see it. Once I've seen it, you can put it down again. And then we're going to all pray together. So let's all pray, those online, those in the room. And let's say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the work of the cross. You died for my sin. You rose again on the third day. And you forever live to be my Lord. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Today, I'm a member of the family of God. Today, I'm a Christian. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a shout.